Copyright, University of South Australia. This recording may contain third-party copyright material. Apart from any use permitted under the Copyright Act 1968, no part of this recording may be reproduced or rebroadcast by any means or process without the prior written permission of the University of South Australia and the copyright owners. Welcome to a short video uh, which is going to be in three parts talking about the osteology and the joint structures of our vertebral column. So let's start with the cervical vertebrae. So the cervical vertebrae is your, your neck vertebrae and there are seven of these. All right, so there's seven cervical vertebrae and when we talk about the thoracic and the lumbar there'll be 12 there and five there. So a good way to remember that is like breakfast, lunch and dinner. So seven, 12 and five, breakfast, lunch and dinner times of the day. Now, the cervical vertebrae in general are quite small. So here's an example of a real cervical vertebrae that we have. So you can see that the body is very small, right? And it's got some special features. So if you write down some of those special features, so it's got a small body, then it has some interesting features here on either side and these are called transverse foramina and transverse foramina are special in that they only exist in the cervical vertebrae and what goes through them is an artery and specifically the vertebral artery which we'll talk about a little bit later then we can see that the vertebral foramen which is this opening here where my finger is is quite large in comparison then it has articular facets which actually lie on a diagonal so they lie obliquely but slightly more was in the horizontal plane so what this means is that this orientation of the vertebrae and specifically the articular facet allows the neck to move in many directions so we can flex our head which is to bring the chin towards the chest, extend our head, taking the chin towards the sky, then we can rotate obviously to the right, to the left, and then we can laterally flex the neck by taking either the right or the left ear towards the right or the left shoulder. So this is all occurring in a gliding type motion. Then we can also see that on another vertebrae that we have here, oh, well, this one actually, is that the spinous process which is this back part has two parts to it and we call this the bifid spinous process. So these are some of the defining features of cervical vertebrae. Now, some of the special ones that we have here is we have one of them called the atlas and another one called the axis. Now these ones here are really special because they are atypical types of vertebrae. So typical vertebrae share common features which are consistent across a number of them. So in the cervical region, we have three which are atypical. They are C1 or the atlas, C, uh, C1 the atlas, yep, C2 the axis, and then C7. So these ones, as you can see, are different to this one here, which is C4 and that's a typical vertebrae. So you can see that these look different, therefore they are atypical. So we've got some atypical vertebrae, which are C1, C2, and C7. And then the other four are typical vertebrae. Okay, so what again, what again were those movements? The movements that we had in the cervical vertebrae were flexion and extension, rotation and lateral flexion. So we can see that there's a quite a mobile area of the vertebral column and it's obviously there to support your head. So if you think about the fact that the bodies of the vertebrae here aren't that large is because it's not supporting that much weight. Whereas when we get to the lumbar vertebrae, we'll see a, a, a stark contrast where the vertebral bodies are really big because it's supporting a lot of our body weight. So let's have a go at labeling these vertebrae. All right, so if we outline these drawings and see if you can draw along at the same time. So pause the video as you need to and then draw along with these videos to try and have a go at then labeling the structures. Otherwise, just find a nice picture somewhere on Google so that you can then have a go at um, labeling these structures as well. So this 
one that we're drawing here, this bone is C1 or the atlas. Okay, so C1 or the atlas. Now the reason why it's called the atlas is because it goes underneath your skull. So there's a story in Greek mythology where atlas, the titan, is holding up the globe, right? And that's where it gets its name from. So if we're going to have a go at um, labeling some of the structures here, we can see that this one does not have a body. So the body of the vertebrae here does not exist in C1. So this is primarily why it's classed as atypical. Now if we would talk about its other features here, it's got some structures out to the side, and these are called the transverse process. All right, and there's one on either side, and you can actually feel the approximate position of these if you push just behind your jaw into that uh, opening space in your neck there. All right, or you can actually feel them on the back of the dog's head. It's the first wide process on the neck. Here, this is called the anterior tubercle. And the same then here would be called the posterior tubercle. So what's different here then is that the rest of our vertebrae have these structures here. So this is the spinous process, whereas the atlas only has a posterior tubercle, so another reason why it is classed as atypical. This part here is called the superior articular facet. So each vertebrae will have a superior articular facet and an inferior articular facet. So the bone above will lie on the superior articular facet and the bone below will articulate with the inferior articular facet and we'll talk about this one in a bit more detail later. Then this large opening here is the vertebral foramen which would be carrying the spinal cord. Then this hole the transverse foramina, which as we said before, will be carrying the vertebral artery. Then it's got these two structures here, which are lateral masses, all right? So that area in there and that area in there. And then this area here is the articular facet for the dens. So when we put C1 and C2 together here like this, you can see that this structure, which is called the dens, actually articulates with the inner aspect of the vertebral foramen of C1. So the articular facet for the dens actually lies just in here like this. So if we're going to give some colour to some of these structures, all right, so that we can understand them better, the areas that we're going to be shading blue are going to be our articular facets. So we should imagine that we would have our hyaline cartilage lying on those places. Therefore, these are for articulations um, between the bones. And then just the brown is the rest of the bone, which is just uh, non-articular in this case. All right, so once again, the atlas is atypical because it does not have a vertebral body and it does also not have a spinous process. All right, so that's our atlas. Now the axis is the next bone in series and what's its prominent feature is this one here, the dens. All right, so the dens or the tooth which is also called the odontoid process, is a special feature in that no other bone has this feature. All right, so the dens is very special and special just for the axis. Okay, so this bone is C2 or the axis. Now, why is it called the axis? The reason it gets its name as the axis is because it actually forms a pivot, right? So if you think about it on a car, you've got the car's axle, so the wheel would pivot around the axle. Now, if we talk about the joint between these two bones, so adding this bone and this bone together, we actually get a joint which is called the atlantoaxial joint. Now, the atlantoaxial joint, because it has this tooth or odontoid press, uh, process, all right, and that's the axis or the point of pivot, we actually can call this the no joint because to shake our head and say no is would be achieving here. So this is a synovial joint and a pivot joint. Okay, 
What's really interesting though, is that the articulation between C1, the atlas, and C2, the axis, actually has three articulations. So you can see that here we've got one of the inferior articular facets of C1, and the second articular facet of C2, uh, so C1, sorry, and then they come with the superior articular facets of C2, plus then the dens coming with its articular facets. So we have one, two, three, articulations between these two bones. So that means that the central one, where you have the dens coming with the atlas, this is a pivot type joint. And then these lateral ones here, these are plane type joints. So you can see two flat surfaces coming together and that would allow rotation in the horizontal plane because of the orientation of these articular facets. All right, so your atlanto axial joint is a synovial pivot, all right, and it's also synovial planar. So just to clarify, this is between the dens and the atlas, all right, and this is between the articular facets. Now another name for this planar articulation that occurs in all other vertebrae is Z joints or zygopophyseal joints. All right, and these ones we'll talk about in all other vertebrae uh, as we go along. So to color in the articular facets here, this is the superior articular facets of the axis. All right, and then a little blue part on the back here of the dens would actually be where a ligament passes across. All right, so to, to, to reduce any friction that would occur there, there's a small amount of articular cartilage. All right, so then here, we also have some new features which exist in other vertebrae as well, okay? So as an example, C2 is still atypical, all right? But it does have a few more consistent features that other vertebrae then also do have. So some examples of some consistent features that some other vertebrae do then have, which would also be shared by the um, axis, so C2, or the axis is a body. So this part here is the body of C2, all right? Then we have the superior articular facets. Here then we have a transverse process. Then we have that transverse foramen. This part here is actually called the lamina and that's another feature which we'll see on other bones as we go through the through the series. Here the vertebral foramen. Okay and then some books would also describe this part here as the pedicle of the vertebrae as well which we'll talk about in more detail in some other vertebrae which will make a bit more sense. So, the spinous process of C2 is actually the first one that you can feel, all right? So, this is a spinous process here at the back. So, if you feel on the back of your skull and then palpate just a little bit further downwards, you'll feel that there's a, a large kind of soft spot just immediately underneath the skull. And then from there, when you have your neck flexed, so your chin down towards your chest, the first bony prominence that you feel sticking out of the top of your neck is the spinous process of C2. What you might actually find from there is that they reduce in size a little bit. So C3, C4, C5 is actually gonna be the smallest, then C6 and C7 is gonna be the largest one that we can feel, all right? So depending on your um, bony anatomy, you might be able to feel these better or not as much as some other people. Now, if we then talk about the C7, which is whilst it's still atypical, it does have some more typical features. All right, so this is beginning to look a lot more like what general vertebrae tend to look like. So here, having a go at outlining this one, so you following along as well. Okay, so what do we have here? We then have the vertebral body, or the body here, and this is what actually gives your vertebrae 
some of its height. So in between each of these vertebrae that have bodies, you would then find an intervertebral disc, okay, which is gonna give you height. Now, if you measure yourself in the morning, you'll be about one to two centimeters taller than you would be at night, because over time, in, during the day, the vertebrae would reduce in size. So then, this part here is called the pedicle, right, and that'll become more apparent when we do the thoracic vertebrae. Then here we have a transverse process. So what are these transverse processes for? These are for um, muscles to attach to, to be all about to move your neck as an example. And this area here is the superior articular facet. And here we have the lamina, the spinous process, vertebral foramen, and then the transverse foramen. All right, so to color this one in again, areas that we have articulation, here would be that plain synovial joint and the zygopophyseal joint between the vertebrae, between superior and inferior articular facets. And now we also then have one large one here anteriorly. So this is a little bit different, this joint, in that it would go bone, intervertebral disc, and then bone above. So what this means is this is no longer a synovial type joint, but is now a fibrocartilaginous joint. So a fibrocartilaginous joint, just to remind you, was a joint that would have a fibrocartilaginous disc existing in it to therefore create the articulation. So other examples of a fibrocartilaginous joint would have been your pubic symphysis that we talked about. So if you remember what we said about fibrocartilaginous or secondary cartilaginous type joints is that these only exist in the midline. All right, so let's just write a small note up here. Between vertebral bodies is secondary or fibrocartilaginous joints, okay? And these have intervertebral discs. All right, so if you've heard somebody saying that they've slipped a disc before, this is what they're meaning by that. All right, so that was uh, the first part on the cervical vertebrae, and we'll talk to you again soon about the thoracic.